website to Ian Instone, who I'm sure many of you know or have heard of. Um, so Ian has been a member of the AGS since the 1990s and he's got four gold bars to his name and I imagine that many of you know better than me what that means <laughs> but for those of you who may not know that means he's got over 250 first place plants in the open section of the flower shows. So an, a marvellous grower and a dab hand at growing Favratia zoysii um, or otherwise known as Campanula zoysii. Um, recent name change there. So um, Ian has grown an amazingly huge plant much bigger than the one that he grew last year which earned a certificate of merit at one of the shows and he's here to uh, talk about his plant and tell us how he does it. So I'm going to hand over to Ian now. Oh, just one note, but over to Ian now. Thank you very much. Over to you, Ian. Hello, everybody. I've um, had my hair permed, especially for the occasion. I hope everybody can hear me. Can you hear me? Wave if you can hear me, okay. Right, thank you for allowing me into your homes. Uh, it's good to see that you're all wearing masks and personal protection equipment. Um, and obviously, Pointless has finished on the telly, so you've managed to make it. Uh, and I hope you've all been to the toilet before we start. Right, as Richard Awadi from Crystal Maze would say, thank you for watching, if indeed you are. Before we start, I'll read you my disclaimer. Uh, everything I am about to say is from my own experience whilst experimenting with Favratia zoysii. I may be giving you incorrect facts about this plant, but this is what I have discovered works for me. Right, what could possibly go wrong? Uh, by the way, it's my birthday tomorrow, so uh, if you can be very kind when you're slagging me off on Facebook tomorrow, it would be uh, very kind of you. Right, I'm going to show you the actual plant before we start. Uh, I'm, you'll have a big screen shortly, but just at the moment, I'll show you this fantastic plant. Here we are, look. That's a Fabratia zoysii. Uh, obviously, no one's impressed by that at all. But that's where that's your starting point if you're if you're lucky if you can get hold of one uh, after maybe a year and then we move on to stage two which is the plant that you saw uh, on the, all the adverts it looks better on the um, this is the actual plant that actual plant died unfortunately but this is the this is a, an imitation cardboard replica of, uh, of what it would have been this year uh, so that's the one that looks absolutely brilliant and massive and people said it's one of the biggest ones they've ever seen. Uh, this next one is, I hope, the biggest one you've ever seen. Right, that lump, the lump on the top is my head, not a large flower. Uh, now, Too heavy to hold. Right, you will be, I'll, I'll put it on the screen as a, as a picture so you can actually see it a little better. Right, here we go. Share screen. That one. Share. Can't find slideshow. 
Uh, if you click from beginning on the far left, Ian, I it did should do work. That. Yeah, from beginning, but it doesn't seem to like it. Oh, it's gone. Hey. We've cracked it. Right. Right, I became obsessed with this plant um, many years ago, uh, probably about 10 years ago, and I decided that I've been seeing people getting foreign medals, that my only chance of ever getting one is if I could actually produce a large plant of Fabrachia zoysii. And since then I've been experimenting uh, uh, and this year I've managed to get what I call a, a pretty good plant. And of course there are no shows. So uh, there goes the foreign medal because unfortunately this plant will be as dead as a dodo next year. It's it's now at its maximum age, probably. It's a shame that first your show was cancelled, but the pandemic came along to uh, make it even worse. So never mind. I'm still here to tell the tale. Right. First of all, here's the picture of the actual of the actual cushion. My creation. It's about it's in a 33 or a 36 centimetre pot. Uh, last year. It hasn't spread to its full potential. So this is what it looked like at the first show, show last year. That's the same plant, uh, and it's still got a burst in the open section in the large pan class. Uh, if people had seen the plant, what it looks like now, it probably would have not got anything. In it. it looks rubbish now compared to what it was uh, la uh, last year, what it compared to what it is this year. Uh, I'm saying this is probably the final year, so I shall have to start again. Over the years, I've discovered that it is a very short-lived perennial. I can usually get it to a maximum leaf cushion diameter of around five inches. That's about 13 centimeters. And that's in an 18 centimeter pot after four years. When in flower, the inflorescence can cover a diameter of about 26 centimeters, as you saw on the photograph uh, on the on the website because uh, it obviously extends and spreads over the over the pot but the actual diameter of the cushion I say is about five inches uh, that particular plant the 18 uh, centimeter one got a, an award of merit last year i'm pleased to say um, and this is the picture of the same oh hang on here we go i'm missing the, the slides out this is the plant that got the award of merit um, and say so that is in an 18 centimeter pot uh, the flowers are seem to have extended longer on that particular one. It probably it got a little bit, bit, bit more drawn than, the, than this particular one I've got here at the moment. That plant, unfortunately, looks like this now. Um, this is before, it has got a few flowers on it, but as you can see, it's starting to die away uh, and looks in a terrible condition. And this is another plant. This is what it actually should look like at this stage. Uh, when I say this stage, before before the flowers actually came into flower, uh, this is a sort of a typical 18 centimetre maximum size plant that I've found you know, that you actually can get, uh, which is a, like I say, it was a bit disappointing because I just couldn't get a, a larger one, but I'll tell you how, how I did that. In fact, some of you probably know the, the technique yourself. Right, so what do you have to do to get a plant larger in diameter than five inches and keep it going a little bit longer? First of all, let me tell you the soil mix that I have eventually settled with. I'll say it slowly in case you want to write it down. It's nothing exciting. It's basically one, John and his number two, and I tend to use the singletons one if you can get older, but it just seems to be far superior to all the other ones. A bit more expensive, but you do actually get the bigger bag. So that's the singletons, John and his number two, one part, and then one part leaf mould, uh, which I must warn you about the leaf mould. I've been doing, making my own leaf mould, not realising that it's full of some horrible kind of insect larva, and I managed to uh, use it on my uh, trilliums and found these little tiny grubs eating all the combs and. Uh, I, I didn't sterilise it, so please make sure you sterilise your leaf mould. Learned that the hard way. 
So one John in is one leaf mold, half composted bark, half a composted bark, which um, again isn't easy to, to get hold of. And then I have one and a half parts uh, sharp grit. So one and a half parts, four millimeters sharp grit, if you can get hold of that. And another one and a half parts pearl white. So it's very open mix. And then I also put in one or two teaspoonfuls of dolomitic limestone powder. Uh, I got this off the internet from a, a farmer somewhere in Pontefract, which is sort of close to where I live. But uh, dolomitic limestone powder, which seems to work. Tufa is good if you can get all the powdered tufa, but uh, I'm in one of these positions where I, I have no chance. So I'm finding this dolomitic limestone powder does work. So this plant is short lived. From my uh, experience, maximum of five years. This, this large plant now is five years old. And I say, I, normally I usually get four years, but I've managed to wangle a fifth year. When you obtain a Favratia plant, your first job should be to take cuttings. Oh, already got that off. If you, if you buy the plant in flower, as soon as the flowers start to go over, cut off each flower stem just below the bottom flower on each stem. Try and leave the stem as long as possible. Favratia can flower itself to death, which is why the flowers need to be removed. Also, cutting the stems too short will kill the plant. The stems should now produce rosettes of leaves near the base of the stems, and the plant also sends out underground runners some of which appear quite a distance from the main plant. I tend to dig these out with my tweezers and plant them up as rooted cuttings. Well, as my father used to say, Irishman's cuttings, but I don't think you can say that these days. Um, I also pull off a few more rosettes from the main plant with the roots to try and increase my stock. Because of the cut stems on most of these cuttings, they don't always produce plants. I have much better success earlier in the year when the plant is growing, but before it starts to send up the flower spikes. I put the cuttings into the same soil mix that I mentioned earlier. Just as an aside, I was told by someone that once a zoysii plant reaches the outside of the pot, it would automatically die. Uh, I'm not sure if, uh, about this, but as a safeguard, this is why I take out the long underground runners which can appear on the extreme edges of the pot. You can see on that picture that uh, I've moved the, the flower stems away and there are lots of runners appearing around the edge of the pot. Uh, so just in case they are warning the plant that it's reached its maximum diameter, uh, I take them off and it gives me lots more extra plants. I think I've got about 50 rooted cuttings at the moment, so ready for next year. If you don't want to take cuttings at the flowering stage when you buy it, remember it's still important to remove all of the flowers as soon as possible. Again, as high up the stem as possible to extend its life. So that is uh, a plant that should be in full flower now, which I've removed them all, uh, because I've got such a lot, I don't have to sort of keep that particular plant uh, going with flowers because I can look at them on the other plants that I've got. So this is the earliest I've ever taken them uh, from the plant. And as you, cut the, as you do cut the plant, uh, as you do cut the stems, a white latex-like substance will exude from the top of each cut stem, which smells of tea pods for some strange reason. So remember, if you cut the stem too low, you will kill the plant. You can actually see the latex uh, exuding from two of the three of the stems near the front, the white latex. After removing the, the flowers, the stems stay green and fresh for a long time. In fact, some of them will send out new, uh, send out extra branches with flowers on, which again, you will have to remove. During this time, new, reef, new leaf rosettes form around the base 
of each flower stem. Then as autumn approaches, the stem and the original basal rosette go brown and dry up and fall away from the rest of the plant. So at this stage, it can then easily be removed with no effort. You mustn't try and pull away the old stem until it comes free itself, or you will pull away the new leaf rosette. The plant will look a, dishe will look a little dishevelled over winter, but it will pick up in early spring when more rooted cuttings can easily be taken along with any underground runners that appear as new plants. This is again, again a little distance away from the, from the main plant. These cuttings are put together, seven cuttings into a four inch pot. I'm calling them cuttings, but they've actually they've all got roots on to start off with. Seven cuttings in a four inch pot and leave until it is obvious that they are growing, probably after eight weeks. Each of these new plants are now individually potted up into three inch pots and grown on for two years, moving into larger pots as the cushion increases. Those are all zoysii at different stages, from cuttings at the bottom up to the 18 centimetre pot at the top right. That's just some of them. So obviously I, have to, I, know, I grow a lot of them. Once again, I keep taking more rooted cuttings from the young plants to keep it going. Because I have quite a few plants, I am removing the flower buds from some plants before they can flower to see how they perform. During the third year, some of these plants are moved into 18 centimetre pots for show purposes to exhibit in the small pan open section. Also, at the beginning of the third year, at the beginning of spring, six of these three year old plants are planted into, into a 33 36 centimetre pot, one in the middle and five around the outside edge of it, leaving about 18 uh, millimetres between each plant. And then during the spring and early summer, these plants will grow into each other to produce a large cushion. That's the monster one I've got here uh, with all the six, seven cushions now grown into each other. This is now the fourth year and ready for the show, if there is one. Unfortunately, after flowering, there's a good chance the whole plant will die, even if the flowers are removed after the show. So I say, I shall be removing all the flowers from this one, but there's a good chance I shall lose it. Some parts of the plant did die over winter when I grew this last year. I thought I was going to lose it after the previous show. Uh, but I removed the brown bits quite early in spring and the rest of the plant grew back over and covered the plant. So I, I, it went back to a, a full cushion. So that was very fortunate, very fortunate indeed. I'm just showing a picture of the two plants together. Uh, that is the 18 centimetre pot on the left which uh, is the uh, one that sort of people thought it was massive but it, it isn't really uh, and the one on the right is the is the new uh, monster um actually when i go into the greenhouse anywhere near it i'm sure i keep expecting it to uh, start talking to me and say feed me you've all watched that film i hope never mind so it is five years old beating all my records so i definitely think this will be its last performance Point of phrase, all dressed up and nowhere to go. I will be growing a backup for this next year, so please bring back all the shows, especially per show. I must now mention where I grow the plants. The plants appear to be far more delicate than the younger ones. The larger plants that I feel to, they appear to be much uh, more delicate than the, the younger ones. Uh, two years ago, I had a quite a large zoysii. Uh, and a few days before the show, we had uh, this dreaded heat wave that we keep getting at this time of the year. Uh, and the heat in my greenhouse toasted the plant before I could uh, remove, rescue it. Uh, this is what happens when you toast the zoysii, uh, unfortunately. 
uh, that was beautiful. It doesn't look too big, but it was a fair sized plant and uh, uh, lots of tears were shed when that happened. So what I do now is I put uh, laps of wood on the south facing roof of the greenhouse to give a dappled shade effect. It looks a bit uh, uh, dodgy really, but it does actually work. They are um, canalized uh, pieces of fence. Uh, just nail a piece on the top edge and hang it over the over the top and hope we don't get any ridiculously strong wind, which we have done. You can also see I've got um, uh, a solar panel on the top there, uh, which is I'll mention in a moment. I also paint the greenhouse, which I actually haven't done at this point because I took this photograph uh, um, a while ago. I paint it with um, a whitewash of greenhouse shade. Then on the inside, I have a layer of plastic netting. You see the sort of, oh, where the window is, you see the plastic netting. Uh, and then on really hot sunny days, I drape lengths of 50 to 70% shading material on the south facing roof as well. So by the time I finish, it's a bit like the black hole of Calcutta in there. Um, unfortunately. And then finally, I have a solar fan. Uh, this is close to my Fabratia and Dionysia plant. You can see there's a couple of Dionysias just in front of the Fabratia. Uh, uh, as brilliant as that, it, it costs about a hundred pounds, that includes the solar panel. There's only one company that seems to sell fans of that size that are solar powered. It's obviously useless in winter if you want to keep the air moving, but in summer, as soon as the sun comes out, it goes mad, uh, which is uh, what I actually wanted it for. And it doesn't cost anything. Brilliant. I'm a Yorkshireman. Having done all that, the heat... Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going backwards. Oh, sorry. Right, so having done all that, the heat was so bad a week or so ago, the large Fabratia, that I've just shown you the picture of that one there in front of you, uh, I just managed to rescue it in time again. It was the heat that got to it again, even with all the, the shading. So I put it outside uh, in the shade at the back of the house with a, a drink of uh, cool water. Unfortunately, it actually recovered, thank goodness. Um, I've never got any seed from the Fabratia because I remove all the flowers to extend its life. However, this year, because I now have a lot of spare plants to experiment with, I've been looking closely at the plant's reproductive system, if I'm allowed to say that. Here is a picture of the flower from the side. So I hope, I hope some of the, uh, by the way, I've been using sort of micro, micro photography on some of this, using my uh, super quality um, uh, phone. <laughs> it's better, it's, it produces better pictures than my, my camera, so, uh, uh, and I can get in a little bit closer. So one or two of them are a bit fuzzy, but it gives you the idea. So this is how the Zoysii works. So this is a picture from the side, and this is another picture from the front. You can see it's, uh, it's got this crimped end to stop things getting in, which is a bit silly when you think about it, to start off with. Um, so it obviously makes it a little bit difficult to pollinate. So I tore open a developed flower, And inside, I discovered that it had this yellow fluffy ball shaped stigma just inside the flower behind the crimping. And the style has a 90 degree bend in it at the end, just before, just before it gets to the stigma. The style has this little bend in it, making it look like a long stemmed smoker's pie. There are five stamens. And they reach about halfway down the flower tube. But all appear to be devoid of any pollen. I then realized that all the pollen was attached to the stigma, giving it the fluffy appearance. This prompted me to look inside a flower that wasn't fully developed. It's about half grown. To my amazement, the anthers are all hugging the stigma, 
being held there by the tight Corolla tube. See the stigma in the middle there? It looks to be all spiky. As the flower develops, the style extends, taking the pollen sacs with it. At this point, is that right? 13? No, it's got to be 14. And then, for some reason, it bends this at 90 degrees just before it reaches the crimped end of the flower. This now made me want to solve the rest of this mystery. Insects can now more easily reach the pollen inside because the pollen all over the stigma is at the end of the flower tube but it's crimped up. And the other thing is the stigma is already coated in its own pollen. Absolutely coated in its own pollen, which seems, so you think, well, it must be self pollinating itself. Uh, but I had to take more pictures and watch it. Luckily, all this happened just before this talk, so I could get these pictures and actually tell you what's actually happened. There's nothing on the internet either to help with this. I, I searched and searched, but there's nothing there to help me, unfortunately. So I started, so I decided to keep watching the stigma. Uh, and um, each day to monitor what's happened. And the stigma appears to eject the pollen onto the inside of the crimped flower, the end of the flower. So there you can see the inside of the flower and the, the stigma is getting rid of the pollen onto all the hairs on the crimped end of the flower. Then, to my amazement, the stigma, once it's just got rid of all the pollen, it then splits into three. You can just see it on this picture beginning to split into three. All the pollen has been deposited onto the hairs around the entrance and it begins to split into three. Then, it opens up even more and produces three more domes of, uh, on the inside of the stigma. So we've got the inside of the stigma now, totally pollen free. I mean, you might be able to see a little bit of pollen on that because I've caught it by accident. But it's pollen free, all the insects, all the uh, pollen has been deposited around the entrance of the flower. Uh, I then thought, well, that's it, I've, I've cracked it, that's everything that happens. Obviously, something then bobs its head through and uh, puts fresh pollen onto the, onto the stigma. Um, but anyway, what about I then noticed that the um, flowers, the cream tent, started to open up slightly to expose all the, the hairs just inside the flower. So we started and thought, oh, they must open up a long way, but no, it still keeps quite tight uh, for some reason. And if you see in the middle there, it's a, so it looks like a brown bit, but that's the actual stigma just behind the um, these hairs on the open end of the flower. Now at this point, I hadn't seen any nectar inside the flower to attract any insects. Uh, I contacted Tim Lever because such a lot of people have asked me about uh, getting hold of one of these plants. I contacted him to find out why it wasn't it wasn't advertised that he sold it anymore. And apparently the, last year they had a, uh, they nearly lost it. They got they, they didn't root and all sorts of problems. Uh, and um, but he now has a few coming along and hopefully to answer the question of some people uh, it, it will have some and they'll be ready around about um, September time no yeah September. yeah around about September you'd have to give him a ring though and whether he'll send them through the post is another story anyway back to the story here he told me that he had seen he thought he was quite excited because he'd seen um, a hummingbird hawk moth 
on his on his one of these fabratias and he's thinking you know it must be a hummingbird hawk moth that pollinates them so this then made me think well there must be some nectar there somewhere where would the hummingbird hawk moth come along because i don't think they just collect pollen so i then ripped the, another flower open at this stage and uh, had another look inside the flower to check you know where's the nectar This is at the bottom of one of the flowers. You can see that the uh, stamens uh, have opened, well, they're opening up, they're just falling out sideways. And at the bottom, there's like a little, it, it flattens the, the, the bottom of that uh, stem, stamen. Uh, and, but again, there's no sign of nectar at this point. I then thought, I need to look at one of these uh, plants that have actually got to the stage where they've actually opened up the stigma the stigma is now open ready to receive pollen and on those plants then this i noticed it's difficult to see from this it's not a very clever photograph but you can actually see on the right hand side and not the bottom one on the, the right hand side three uh, stamens you can see little white blobs that is actually glistening and what happens is they are peeling back and exposing nectar. So there's now nectar there to attract the pollinated insects at the correct time when the stigma has opened to receive the new pollen. Again, amazing all this lot. It, uh, anyway, that's sorry. I just, I just find this whole procedure amazing. Uh, so when the stigma is uh, on the flower, so the, uh, I've just told you all that. I've said that without reading it, sorry. Shouldn't have done that. Um, as it pushes, oh, here we go. Uh, now, insects, I reckon, as the insects, whatever it, one it is, uh, it will push its head into the entrance. And as it does so, uh, it's, uh, it, will, it will pick up pollen from all the hairs where all the other pollen has been deposited. But its head will have pollen on, hopefully, from another uh, plant. And as its head just sort of enters slightly, it will head both into the stigma, which is just at the back of these hairs, hopefully transferring pollen from another plant onto it. I've now tried to pollinate a few flowers uh, myself this year to see if I can, I can see if I can get any seed from them. Um, and because I've got a few spare plants, I can afford to try and try and do this and I've tried to cross pollinate them as well as pollinating them and I've tried to cross pollinate it with a uh, campanula hook for some reason it just happened to be in flower at the same time so I thought I'll see if I can uh, transfer pollen to see if I can get something to appear and I've also had a strange situation where I nearly lost all my phytoplexus commotus and they all dried up, had them in the greenhouse, didn't get them out in time. They all dried up, but one or two of them, they've all come back again, but one, one of them has actually produced a flower. And when I say a flower, I mean a single flower, not a cluster of flowers. That's the beastie. Uh, it looks a bit of a, <laughs> a failure, but it has produced pollen and it has produced its stigma opened up. So what I've done is, it's again, a Campanulacea, I believe, so I've actually crossed it with zoysii. So that's now got zoysii pollen on it. You can actually see the, the white, uh, the, the pale yellow bits on it, uh, like on my screen. And I've also put the, the purple pollen from that onto a couple of the zoysii that have opened up the stigma. So I may be creating some kind of new monster, hopefully. Um, Brian Burroughs, just to give him a mention, we're nearly there now. Uh, Brian Burroughs, he managed uh, in the past to cross pollinate it with Campanula puller and produced a hybrid called Cantata. Um, now, I, I, I do believe that um, Tim Lever at Abercrombie Nursery, they do actually sell that one, it still exists. Uh, but it's, um, I think, I think Zoysia is much prettier, to be quite honest with you. Uh, finally, if it can be crossed with another Campanula, surely uh, it must be a Campanula. Uh, not a Fabratia, a totally different genera of uh, which there is only one member apparently. So thank you for watching.
if indeed you still are.